Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here with a little introduction. So good morning or evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Lamari, and I'm Senior Director of Community Engagement here at the Decentralized Identity Foundation. So today I am introducing one of our side sessions of our ongoing DIF hackathon, which began last week, and it will be going until December 1st. So you have a full 30 days of hacking uh, under your hat right now. Uh, you still have plenty of time to form teams and to make submissions. So we are very happy to be joined by one of our hackathon sponsors today, Trinsic. Uh, we originally were going to be joined by Tomislav Mark Arkovsky, but unfortunately last minute he was not able to join us. So today uh, we are being joined by JP George, who is the head of engineering at Trinsic. And the topic today is an introduction to Trinsic. We'll give you details. They will give you details on that will help you if you do want to move forward with Trinsic's prize challenge. The prize pool from Trinsic is 2,500. And also he will be going through an introduction to BBS as this is uh, something that, this is actually one of the work items at DIFF uh, that uh, can be actually used in your hackathon submission. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to JP. I also just will mention that if you have any questions along the way, feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. All right, take it away, JP. Awesome, thanks for the introduction, uh, Lamari. I hope you're all uh, enjoying the hackathon so far. Um, Twinsic actually got started when the co-founders met at a hackathon uh, SSI in, I think, 2019. So um, it's always a fun, a fun place to meet people and get to know a lot of people in the industry that you know might want to start some fun stuff together. Um, I've been in the identity space myself for about eight, nine years, mostly in physical access control industry. So like, how can you prove who you are when you want to enter a building? Um, and for the last one and a half years at Trinsic, we really try and make a decentralized identity uh, play a reality. Um, yeah, I'll share my screen. Uh, just checking, is that visible for everybody? <clears throat> Looks good. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so Transic is a decentralized identity company. We try to position ourselves as a, an infrastructure company for digital IDs, um, where you know a SaaS service, a meta SaaS service, and we want to help build, uh, help you build integrations that use things like verifiable data, um, issuing verifications, wallet, verifiable credentials, um, decentralized identifiers, reusable identity. That's already a lot of service, right? And SSI is kind of a pretty complicated technical environment, and we're really here to help companies focus on their core business, their go-to-market, rather than having to really be aware of all the complexities involved. You can leave that to us, we'll figure out what needs to be done, and uh, you can focus on actually going to market um, and building a cool product. Um, we probably all know that identity is broken. Um, I recently immigrated to the US and I bet nobody is super surprised to hear that my passport, birth certificate, and honestly tons and tons of other documents are in countless places. Some interesting, very old looking and questionable security portals of the government, the US government, um, some portal of the lawyer. Um, at some point, it kind of became email chains between the lawyer and me and some other people. Um, so, you know, my, you know, my, primary identity documents that literally allowed me to immigrate to another country um, are spread around. And I think we've all got plenty of stories like that. Um, the main problem that we have is that we still rely on physical documents to prove things, right? We still have to kind of take a picture of our ID with a camera or scan it or go to the city hall and get a piece of paper with a notarized stamp on it and then upload that again, a scan, right? Um, and we have a lot more advanced and practical solutions out there. That's where SSI and digital identity can really come in. Um, we want to make sure that we can prove who we are and share as much information as is needed, but not more, which is also a big difference between just the paper documents, right? Um, if I want to go into a bar, the classical example, do you really need to know my, um, my full name or where I'm born? Probably not. <clears throat> so great. SSI is really cool. Why is digital identity not 
way more widely adopted. Well, there's a bit of a problem with um, adoption in a place like this. And one of those, and I think this is the primary one, is what they call the cold stock problem or the chicken and egg, right? You've got a three-sided adoption challenge. We all know the two-sided adoption place for like um, an eBay needs to have both sellers and buyers. And that's going to already be quite tough to kind of bootstrap a, a place like that. Um, there's some interesting horror stories about how eBay was like doing fake advertisements and fake buyers themselves, etc. cetera. Um, never know what is true or not, but you know, it's a, it's a tough problem to overcome as a company. And with identity, you actually have three. You know, why would a holder download a wallet if there's nothing to do with that wallet? Uh, why would a verifier start accepting credentials and verifying things if there are no credentials and there are no holders around? And why would an issuer start issuing if nobody wants to have a wallet um, or nobody has a wallet or nobody wants to verify? So you have this sort of interplay between these three parties that all need to play together to get to a place that brings that kind of benefit of digital identity around. Now, luckily... Um, this is not new, right? We've all been working on this in the identity space for quite a while. So a lot of very interesting initiatives are happening all around the world uh, on a very technical level, but also at things like governments and organizations at kind of like generally seen as like roots of trust for systems like this. Um, so there's a lot more adoption happening all around the world. Um, but, you know, the, the big thing is obviously still that some of us might have a digital identity, um, especially if you live in the US in certain states or if you live in Europe in the next one or two years, um, but it's not this like super prevalent um, solution that we all have and share. So extrinsic, we think that building an ecosystem is the only thing that really matters to bring that cold start problem around. Um, it will be, only, be the only thing that will help get SSI to reach the adoption that we want it to have. And we as a company try to provide value for the providers of this ecosystem. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about what a provider is. You might've heard of the trust triangle in some other session or in some documentation. You've got this issuer and the holder and the verifier, and they all have to trust each other to play in an uh, SSI ecosystem. And we've added this extra dimension to this, which we call the provider, which is any kind of entity and organization that ideally already has a kind of ecosystem or has a way to get these three parties to play together um, and is able to bootstrap uh, a SSI ecosystem fully with those three parties. So generally, this might be someone who has a couple of issuers, has a couple of verifiers, and has access to those holders either through the issuers or verifiers or might already have their own app. Um, and that brings an interesting aspect as well, right? A lot of users don't necessarily want to go around and think, great, digital identity is really awesome, but now I've got five digital identity apps on my phone and they're all just useful for one place. Maybe it's your health insurance app that you already have and you already have a login in that might sort of behind the scenes have a hidden wallet um, that can be used to then go somewhere else and verify it. So the user doesn't even need to be aware that they are holding an SSI wallet at that point or that they have to have a separate login to play in this digital identity world. Um, Apple, for example, is doing a really good play there with their Apple wallet, of course, where you know, you can add your flight tickets into it, but now in certain states, you can also start doing your mobile driver's license and other kind of documents that, you know, will be very interesting to see how that will play out in the long run. So this is the definition that we have of that provider, which is the entity that creates the ecosystem, onboards the issuers, holders, and verifiers, and establishes trust. I haven't said a lot about trust yet, but we'll dig a bit deeper into that during the demo, and I can kind of show you how that works. Um, trust can be seen as... Um, kind of a programmatic way to ensure that that trust is really adhered to. If you've got one one party in each, it's really easy to trust each other. If you're talking, you know, 7 billion people, tons and tons of organizations, you know, even in like the US, for example, so many states with all their own organizations and agreements, it's going to be very tough to um, get that trust going. And that's where we've got some interesting solutions on managing trust in an ecosystem. The next step will be a little demo. Um, so uh, before I dive into that, are there any questions so far? Anything you'd like me to dig into? If not, I'll move some things around on the screen. I don't see any in the chat, so you can go ahead and, uh, and move forward. 
Great. Thank you. <clears throat> so to, to start with Trinsic as a platform, you first sign up for an account, and we'll share the link later. It's dashboard.trinsic.id. Um, when you do that, you will be able to create an ecosystem. Um, you can create one for free, so feel free for the hackathon to just you know create as many as you want. Um, just mention if you want to that you come from the Diff Hackathon. I think we ask like, hey, how do you know about us? And that way, we'll you know be sure to kind of um, treat you a little bit different um, and give you the best service. Um, once you've created that ecosystem, uh, a big important part is to view the out token, which you can do through this button. Um, we'll use that later in the, in the demo um, when I go into the code. Um, this dashboard is uh, meant for those providers um, so that they can bootstrap their ecosystem very quickly. They can start inviting issuers, they can um, add it verifiers, they can use an, a white-labeled web wallet uh, to really quickly bootstrap their ecosystem. Um, you could kind of get started with, a, with kind of a manual flow very quickly using our dashboard. Um, of course, anything you see here, you could build yourself um, using your own web app or your own mobile application and kind of behind the scenes do all the logic here. Um, like I mentioned, you know, like a healthcare provider, for example, might want to invite issues or holders without necessarily ever touching this dashboard. Um, generally, when you start with an ecosystem, you want to go to create a credential template. I've already created one that we'll use later in the demo just because it can be a little bit of a lengthy process to you know, really write out each part. Um, but I'll just show you a little bit how it would look like. Let's say I would want to make an attendance credential. Um, for the fact that I'm attending this hackathon or any other kind of event, um, I can give it a description. Um, I can give it some sections, for example, a bit of personal information. And as you can see, these are all, you know, I'm just typing what these attributes are, right? I can give it the type as well. I can give it a file, an image, um, and other types here. Uh, we just uh, date time in a little bit. Uh, last name. Let's do another section with event information. And you would be able to see a date of event. Um, Etc. You can add, if it's technically allowed to add attributes on the fly, this can be helpful if you have like a core set of attributes, but any issue we could add something else. Maybe Diff wants to add a you know, Diff membership ID or a Diff hackathon member ID to it, but um, there might be another organization that would love to use the same credential template so that anybody could verify it and they would maybe not want to add that specific ID onto that credential. You then click, in this case, create credential or create template and that template would exist. Um, like I mentioned before, anything you've seen here, you can also do programmatically. So you could you can imagine a certain integration that would just create these templates on the fly. If you're a kind of dynamic ecosystem where you'd have a ton of potential templates that can be created because someone signs up for something and they now want to issue something specific to them and your application is able to create a specific template for them. <clears throat> what we want from this for the code demo is that schema URL that you see here. Um, and we'll want to get that out token from the dashboard. Um, I want to get the code out. All the demo gods will be with me today. Um, you never know. <clears throat> the code for this is open source, and I'll share that in a little bit later, except the out token I removed, even though it's just a, a sample ecosystem. It's obviously a good practice. Um, I'm using Node.js here. Um, I've got two applications. Um, we have SDKs in all kinds of languages, so uh, I'm pretty sure most languages that you'll be building with, we have support for. Um, but no, this is kind of an easy way to get started for everybody, and most people will be able to, to read it, so I chose that for now. Um, we have an issuer application here, which is really kind of a almost command line kind of application. Um, and then we have a verifier here, which serves a very simple HTML page to verify and we'll go a bit more into detail how we're doing that verification um, when we hit that. So to start, um, I want to start issuing a credential. 
I grab the Trinsic SDK. Um, you can see that here as well. I've installed that. Um, I got that out token from the dashboard, like I mentioned. Um, I just want to add my email here so that we can use it later on and that specific um, schema that I mentioned. I'll then create a Trinsic service at that out token from here. And then I create all the values for my credential. Um, now I haven't shown you the credential template yet, so I can just quickly go back to the dashboard and show you what that looks like. Uh, voila. So you see the identity document that we're issuing, which has some personal data, it has some location data about you, and it has some document information. This is just a made up template, right? This is just me sitting around, um, looking at actually Tom's love presentation to be fair and kind of copying what he's done. But um, it's just kind of a general template. And like I mentioned, here's some extra information um, that we'd like to include in the credential that wasn't part of that template. So here you can see how you can add attributes kind of dynamically, just depending on the specific issuer. Um, I'll then talk to the credential service at Trinsic and call the issue from template call. Um, and here are some required parameters. It's that schema that we copied from the dashboard. The values as JSON of the credential. Um, we'll specify the signature type, and this is where things might get a little bit more interesting uh, for the BBS side of things. So we support both um, what we call experimental and is it called standard? Yeah, standard uh, signature types. If you use standard, it will be done using ED25519, which is a NIST approved curve. Um, obviously, some customers will be very interested in. NIST compliance, and they really need to make sure that you know there's a NIST compliance uh, cryptography in use. Um, yet BBS plus is very interesting um, for us, uh, probably for you as well, and for probably uh, a lot of reasons. We're very happy that I think there's a big task force on the way to make it a standardized uh, cryptography scheme. Um, the um, benefits of, for example, using a BBS plus signature. Um, is that you can have selective disclosure, um, which is important, right? If I don't want to share everything here, uh, if I'm attending an event and they just need to know that I am John Doe and I am above 21, let's say I just want to share these three. I don't want that event to know where I live because I don't want to receive any post or whatever. Um, selective disclosure means I can just not send all these parameters around. Um, we can't do that with um, ED25519, but we can do that with BBS Plus. Um, the BBS plus signature, and we'll look a little bit more in detail of how it looks later, is interesting because you can still prove with a selective disclosure, so with a subset of all the fields in that credential, that it was truly signed by the issuer. Um, so the, the proof verification that we're going to do in a little bit is still equally strong if I would share the whole piece of effectively JSON or if I share a subset. And I think that's a very strong benefit of something like BBS. It also has other benefits, like it's really developer friendly, it's really quick, um, right, compared to some other signature schemes that have been used in the industry. Um, so you're, you're talking performance levels that would actually be useful for end users, um, which, you know, that's obviously important for everybody. Um, we have some other parameters when we're issuing. Um, we're not going to include governance, and I'm just going to show you why in a little bit. Um, we can do an expiration date for the credential and we're not going to save a copy, um, which is just kind of a handy benefit for the issuer so that they can keep track of what they have issued. We'll then just output the raw credential to the console um, and we'll send that credential to the email that I specified above. So I'm gonna run through it now. Um, anybody have any questions until here? I see something happen in the chat. Ah, yes. Awesome. Yeah, feel free to interject, by the way, at this part. We have a relatively small enough group that we can just have a quick question about what the parameter is or what I'm doing. Um, so feel free to unmute and jump in or post it in the Slack, uh, in the chat, and Zach or Mari can talk it up. So here you can see, um, I'm now issuing a credential. It will show me some beautiful JSON here, and I can show that a little bit better later on. Um, I can actually do that now. Format. Okay, 
to go. So we have a credential here that I just issued. Um, you can see that it has a type uh, of a verifiable credential. It's also the identity document, and this would be the type that I specified in, in the dashboard or using our SDK. Um, a lot of a credential is actually metadata, right? Really what you specify um, that is the content of a credential is all contained in the credential subject. Like you see here are all those fields that we uh, sort of specified for this specific issuance. And all these other fields are metadata to make sure that the credential can be verified, that there are, um, yeah, that the schema of this credential can be looked up and can be validated by a third party. And those are all important for different, um, for different aspects, but mainly it's important so that we can all be interoperable, right? That you could take a credential from a intrinsic wallet, export it, and uh, use it in a different wallet as long as they support, for example, the BBS signature scheme. Um, and they would allow the same DIT method lookups, you'd be able to use that credential anywhere. Um, so the fact that we all have aligned on a VC um, based model of how these things should look like and what kind of fields are in there um, allows us all to be interoperable with each other. Um, so yeah, we have the type, um, we have some context as well so that we can look up the, um, the schema and uh, make sure that the JSON in here can be parsed and validated um, for your signatures. We have all that credential subject data. So these are all these fields. Um, there's an issuance date and an expiration date because we provided it. There's something called credential status, and we'll go through that in a little bit, but we can revoke a credential. Um, this means that, um, let's say, um, Okay, attendance is a little bit weird to revoke, but an identity document could be revoked, right? Let's say I lost it and I would go to the government and say, I've lost this specific identity document. Can you revoke it? Um, this is used to be able to look up if this document at that point revoked. Um, here we specify who the issuer is, and we'll get back to that in a little bit about um, when we're talking about the verifications that we run. And here is the BBS, BBS BLS signature 2020, which is the current specification that we use um, I think the ITF is working on standardizing a new version and we'll jump on that as soon as that comes out uh, and standardized. Um, and this is kind of the magic here, uh, which is the proof value, which is what we can use to keep generating those selective disclosure proofs while maintaining the cryptographic certainty that the issuer specified here is truly the issuer that um, signed the credential. Um, so with that credential, um, I've added it to my wallet already. Um, let me see if I've actually gotten an email for that. I can show you, I did send a, a notification. You can see here, I've got on an identity document. Um, this is because I had that sent notification parameter sent. Um, and we can see that as well. If I would click on that link, I'll be sent to, in this case, the white labeled web wallets that I mentioned where a provider can really quickly just bootstrap their whole ecosystem. Um, you can see the credential here with all the data that we entered um, and some additional fields. And you'll see, for example, that these all have their friendly name. Um, this one does not have the friendly name uh, because that was an additional field, right? We haven't specified things like friendly name. Um, we're not going to click on these. Uh, but here you can see how I can export a credential or even just delete it. But yeah, if I would export that credential and upload it in a wallet that has the similar capabilities, I would be able to keep using it. You'll also see here, it's an unauthorized issuer. We'll get to that in a little bit, um, what the governance kind of side of things looks like, because right now we've just kind of issued a credential and that's it, right? We haven't really done a lot beyond that. Um, I'll go back to the code now and become a verifier. There we go. I'm going to request a verifiable presentation, um, but first I'm going to show you a little bit how that actually works um, in the background. This is a very, very simple version, right? This is um, effectively um, using a protocol called OpenID for verifiable presentation, where we, um, similar as OpenID Connect, it actually kind of, you can even use an OpenID Connect library to launch a verification. Um, you, um, we've wrapped an OpenID library um, in our own SDK client just to make it even easier where you just have to specify what ecosystem and what schema you want to verify at that point. Um, but you can, behind, you know, behind the scenes, you can look into this, the SDK is open source 
um, you can use any OpenID Connect uh, kind of integration to do that. Um, so as soon as you click on that verify button, we request a verifiable credential with that ecosystem and schema. In this case, we'll do some, some logging of it. We'll also put it inside the HTML of this page. And we'll then do another call to verify that credential. Um, when we return um, that presentation response to you, we have already verified things. We're just doing this again to kind of showcase the best practice, right? You don't really want to just trust Finzik or necessarily the callback that you get to make sure it's truly um, a legit credential. You can for, for example, a front-end flow, but generally you want to ver re-verify it on the backend to really make sure that um, that credential that you've received or the verifiable proof you've received is truly um, a valid proof. So we do that here as well, um, where we go to a little API, um, send that verifiable presentation and wait uh, to see what the verification results are. That little API you can see here, uh, slash API slash verify, where we're just going to the intrinsic um, verify proof call. We give it that proof documents that we had before and we'll send back what, you know, what kind of verifications are, are done, what the response there is. We'll see here the uh, ALF token. Have to double check that it was the right one. Yep, yeah, it is great. So I should be able to click this once I allow the pop ups. Um, I've chosen for pop ups just because it's a little bit easier to demonstrate um, for a demo um, other than the redirect because you can kind of see the, the different flows go around. Um, but the you can do a redirect flow as well, and we even allow uh, an iframe based flow. Obviously, for your users, that would be a little bit of a different experience. You really have to kind of choose uh, what you want to do. Um, so you see here that the verifier uh, is requesting the credential. Um, I can um, untick if I want to some fields here and I would have to select a disclosure. Um, let's just do that. I don't really want to share that additional data that we find there. And um, I want to click verify. And here you see, Zoom out a little bit wrong. Here you can see the Fairfield Hubbard presentation is that first sort of callback after you've completed the OpenID Connect flow. Um, you can see that it has the credential status, the credential subject. Um, you can see the proof. Um, it is important to note that the proof you see here is different than the proof that was in the original credential. So the original credentials proof, is, you should see that almost as a password specific for that specific credential. That's really a, a secure value. If you're going to store the credential somewhere, you, you never want to share that with a third party. Um, you never want to share it back to the issuer, really. You never want to share it to the verifier. Um, because with that proof, you can start to do things like selective disclosure and really prove that you um, have that subset of the credential or even the whole credential done. So it's, it's kind of equally as secure as a password just for that one specific credential. Um, you can see here all the uh, items I've shared and you can see that those fields that I unclicked are not currently in here. Um, we can see here the verification, um, the credential status, if the credential is revoked, it has some, some information to look it up. Um, similar as the credential, right? The verifiable proof is very, very similar as the credential, just a little bit different. And then here's the result of that API call that we did. Um, we're checking if the credential is expired, right? We have that expiration date here. Um, there's plenty of cases where a verifier might be okay with a, a expired credential. Like if you're gonna go and sign up for uh, an event, it's probably not too big a deal that your driver's license is expired, right? You can still prove that you are who you are. It's just an expired one. So it's probably not valid for driving around, but it's kind of valid for low, low touch identity verification cases. Um, we'll check if the credential status, so this is the revocation, if that is currently revoked or not, and in this case it is not. We'll check that the issuer, um, so this did here, is also actually the signer of the proof. That's an interesting case, which might seem a little bit redundant at first, but <clears throat> anybody could theoretically take this piece of JSON and sign it as pretending to be someone else, right? You, we can all generate a signature, um, we can modify this JSON and issue it out. So if you would trust this specific issuer, let's say you have looked it up or use like a governance framework like we have. Um, so you trust this issuer, 
how do you know that that issuer is truly the issuer that has signed that specific um, credential? That's what this checks. So it uses the cryptography here to verify that um, this did document will contain the keys um, that are used to sign that um, credential. We also check if it conforms to the schema, especially as a verifier, you want to kind of have a bit of certainty that that credential comes back as with the data that you're expecting it to be, even with um, selected disclosure. Um, it's still good to know that, you know, there's no wrong fields or random fields in there that uh, in case those are not allowed. And, and we'll of course do the actual signature verification where we go and um, do some cryptography on, is this proof truly valid for this credential um, with the issuer? Um, keys, etc. So that is the sort of starting point of doing an issuance and verification. I can dive into the revocation and governance side of things uh, if we want, but I just want to have a brief point and see if there are any questions or any um, anything else I should dive in before doing that. Yeah, there's a couple of questions in the chat, JP. The first one um, was about a repository for definitions of um, like st standard credential types. So, you know, I think that this is something that we've talked about and explored at Trinsic, but we haven't launched. I think there are some other, you know, initiatives to kind of make the a schema repository. Um, so I don't know if you have anything you want to add about that. Um, no, I think you're right. There's a couple of there's a couple of initiatives in the industry. Um, I know that there is uh, there's a good amount of work in uh, just general schema.org for JSON schemas that can be used. Um, that's very helpful. I think for you know we don't all need to redefine what a driver's license would be, right? There's kind of these predefined um, types already, and there's a big community around around there as well. So it's maybe less of a whole credential, but for like subsets, like for example, you saw me create an address. I was kind of just making that up. That's not an international address, right? Or if it is international, I probably shouldn't call it state because state is a US term um, that we don't have in other, other places. So um, yeah, I think schema.org uh, will help out um, with, with at least parts of a credential uh, standardization as well. And the other question was around, um, Bob with two Bs wrote, how would you address consumables? Say I verified that you're over 21 and created three drink tickets associated with your credential for the bar. I want to know only you use them and you only use them once. Um, yeah, what do you think about that, JP? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you can use a credential with a revocation for that, right? So let's say you would be a verifier to check uh, kind of like we've done here. Um, you know, you could do this via QR code or something like that to when someone comes in. Um, you verify that they're over 21. And at that point, rather than just running a verification and not doing anything, you could become your own issuer, send out the three credentials, um, saying it's a you know a drink credential or something like that. Um, and then once uh, on the bar it's been used, you could have like something that either scans it or some other way where the bar would effectively revoke that specific credential, which could be like through a dashboard or something, but um, it's probably not actually useful in a bar. Um, you then be able to revoke it. Consumables and kind of change transactions. So where like, um, let's say a bank account, right? Where like your bank account isn't like a single number, it's kind of almost a sum of all numbers of all transactions, um, negative and positive in the history. They're always interesting cases to combine with verifiable credentials. So both consumables and kind of chain transactions are, you know, cases you should always have a good look at and see if they're like the most useful to put in a credential. And if so, what would be a good primitive to use for that? Um, if you have a specific use case, Bob, happy to brainstorm afterwards with you as well. Is there anything else, uh, Zach? Yeah, a couple other questions. Mateo said, so you create another VC from the one you're presenting. I saw that the type is verifiable credential, not verifiable presentation. Is that intended? That is a good question. It should be a verifiable presentation. It might just be a toggle that I have disabled. Um, like I mentioned, they are very similar. It's honestly kind of just a wrapping around a verifiable credential. Um, so the fact 
Uh, it's not intended for the demo, but <laughs> we do support both. So you can kind of share a hair fiber credential or a fair fiber presentation. Um, this is not the raw credential, by the way. So you definitely have a different kind of signature, et cetera, going on here. Um, the, yeah, in the case of the example of the bar that I was mentioning, you would create another VC from the one you are presenting. And that is a case that we see happen often, right? Where kind of the, um, the trust triangle almost assumes that they're like really different people, these issuers and verifiers. But what you see happen in reality is that a verifier often uses that initial starting point of say an identity verification or a kind of a, a login or a user credential, which we see a, a good amount of, um, and then says, okay, great. Now I verified that. Now I can attest something different about John because John is also um, something else. So um, yeah, issuer and verifier are separate roles, but they, you know, it happens pretty often that they're actually the same company or a different company, but that they're both the rules. Um, I'll dig into a little bit about the verifiable presentation and credential uh, after this call and make sure to update the demo uh, accordingly. Um, maybe we'll do one more question here, JP. Is, so uh, Austin asks, is there a way to, for the verifier to require that a user provide certain fields in the credential, for example, if they want to know somebody who's 21, they need the holder's date of birth. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about verification templates and you know, and yeah. how, how it's shown that we kind of require certain fields during the verification. Yeah, that's a good question. So the verifier can specify that. Um, the easiest way to do that would be to create what we call a verification template. Um, where you would select here the, attentive, the document that you want. Um, you can give that a name and a description. So you could, for example, say, I want to verify this credential because, let's say I want to verify your driver's license. Well, why am I verifying it if I'm a car, com car rental company? Because you want to rent a car, right? And it's good to show that to the user. Similar as like an actual OpenID Connect login, I need to authorize or um, an application to be able to log in. You know, Google would say, hey, you know, Trinsic.id wants to log in and it doesn't say Trinsic.id wants to do something else. You kind of specify the purpose and then you'd be able to specify what fields would be required. And the user at that point wouldn't be able to unkick. Um, I have to maybe add a little bit to this. So this, um, you could use verification templates outside of our white label platform and, and OpenID Connect sort of flows, um, but you can also verify a credential completely not using that UI that you just saw. So. Um, it's obviously a great way to get started, and it's a great way to not have to worry about things like collective disclosure and verifiers kind of customizing the flows that they want. We've made sure of that. But if you have a very constricted flow, you kind of know the credential templates and you know the verifiers and the issues quite closely, um, you can easily do it through the SDK as well. So everything you saw from like sort of the clicking of the button to open that UI, um, you can do with the SDK um, to verify a credential. Does that answer it, uh, Austin? Awesome. And Mustafa, yeah, I'll, I'll check about that verifiable presentation. Um, we currently don't support selecting the required fields from different uh, verifiable credentials. Um, it's one of those things that like theoretically is really interesting. Um, and will probably be useful, but we haven't really seen a solid use case to say, hey, let's go and build that in now. Um, I can imagine, of course, that like I, um, well, this it, it maybe is an interesting example. In the Netherlands, um, where I'm from, my driver's license would never contain my location. Um, it contains the same sort of personal data and maybe some information around the authority and issuance and whatever, but it never contains your location. And I know that at least in some US states it does. So. I can see use cases where a verifier wants to say, well, I want all that information, um, but we don't currently have that support in our platform uh, built in. I think it becomes interesting, especially if the cryptography around BBS evolves as well to start to be able to do that, um, where you can set up quite some dynamic flows and a verifier says more, I want this information from a valid list of trusted sources rather than like that one specific credential, right? Um, Rohit, what are your recommendations around creating a standard identity record consumable by a relying web party of application 
maybe with a JWT token, post successful proof verification. Um, well, in a way, you'd be kind of doing the demo that I'm doing here, except maybe that last part. Is that right, um, Rohit? Yeah. So the JWT token, I guess it depends a little bit on what you'd want to do with it. Um, JWT is, is a great technology, right? We use it in certain places. So it's definitely not like a kind of competitive standard or, or something that goes against the grain of a verifiable credential. They serve different purposes. Um, so you could put the whole verifiable credential in a JWT uh, or the verifiable proof, uh, really. I would generally recommend a little bit against it because you start to kind of bleed concepts a little bit, but if it's really intended to just sort of transfer the data around, um, you could do something like that. Um, what would be, what would you want to do with that JWT token? Is it used for like authentication later on, or is it used to like contain the credential and present it later in your UI? Okay. So what you can do, if you use the verifier, I'm just shooting from the hip here, right? So um, I might need to know a little more, but if I, as a relying party web application, have received a, a proof that satisfies my requirements, let's say I've received this identity document and you know that satisfies the things that I need, maybe it has some like specific you know, document number that I can use as like my user ID or is, is like added to a user ID, right, on, on my system. At that point, I would probably just issue a new JWT and say, as the relying party, as the verifier here, I have received that credential. I have verified it. I don't need to then issue that back into JWT. I can just sort of almost attest the verification with a JWT and send that back to the front end or, you know, wherever that needs to be. That way you're not kind of resharing that verifiable proof with the data. Um, if you need to, obviously you can, right? Like if you want to have that JWT have the first and last name and date of birth, just because you want to display it in different places, you can do it, but you kind of remove um, the need for resharing that credential all around. If you want to, it, you know, it's fine. You just kind of want to really check if the transports that you use the JWT for, et cetera, are suitable. JWTs are really great for like time bound, short lived credential kind of um, places. That's where you generally see them used. Um, and yeah, although I think JWT is kind of a extension on um, the JWTs, where indeed they're kind of just blending the formats and you can just put a whole credential in a JWT. I'm not sure if they're like completely compatible with any verif JWT verification library. Definitely not to the point of verifying the actual credential, right? Um, but I do think you should be able to verify the actual issuance of the JWT at that point. So yeah, if you want to dive really deep into it, check out the JWT that Otto mentioned. Um, otherwise, yeah, my primary recommendation would be to almost kind of issue a more local temporary JWT that more says, I verified, here's some base data that I really need to use, but I'm going to skip you know, all these things that I don't need to use at that point. Um, if it's just for authentication and then showing a display name or something. Any other questions? Of course, you're welcome. I mean, I maybe show a little bit around trust, um, the trust relationship. So as I showed you, I kind of showed you this, this white labeled um, web wallet. Um, I'll show you my, my credential document here. Um, the, this is great, but obviously you already see here that it's an unauthorized issuer, right? I've, I've kind of set up my ecosystem very bare bones. I've just created a credential template before the demo just to save us a bit of time. Um, I haven't set up any kind of trust here. So um, in um, an SSI world, anybody can pretend to issue a passport, right? It's nothing magical. You can create a private key, uh, a private public key. You can start to issue um, credentials just based on the format. Like I could start to issue a credential for Zach that says I'm a passport, uh, here's your passport. And then how would anybody else be able to verify that? Um, a very simple version of that would be, well, passports are only issued by you know a couple of hundred countries. Here's a list of these countries. Um, and what do we do? Um, 
I was just looking at the chat, but I think Zach got it. Um, here's a list of countries. Um, that becomes problematic pretty quick. Things like keys will be rotated. So what you then um, do is the concept of a trust registry comes up. There's a couple of different ways to do trust registries. Um, we currently use um, one that you can just administer through the dashboard. There's ways you could kind of cache that offline. So you could do some offline verifications. Um, we have that identity document, as you can see here. I previously issued that as a um, as JP plus demo at Trinsic. Before I do that, um, and I'll hurry up a little bit so that I can show it. I'm gonna go back to the issuance of that credential. Um, I'm just gonna change my name to Jane, just so that I can differentiate it in our UI in a little bit. I'm gonna include governance here. So this, um, effectively what I'm saying here is the issue is that I want to issue this credential and make sure that there's some governance uh, structure around it added to it. So I'm going to go back to the issuer side of things. Uh, I will issue that credential. There you go. Now nothing's really changed, right? I haven't made that issuer necessarily an issuer that is valid. I've just said as an issuer, governance is important to me. I want to include the fact that I have governance. Um, we can now see here, I'm just going to throw this into the JSON and have it formatted. Um, we can now see here that the issuer, I should actually do a quick control Z so that we can see it before. Here, the issuer was simply a string with the did uh, document or the did reference for that specific issuer. Um, if I now go back to that one that I issued with governance, you see that the issuer has become a little bit more complicated. We still have that did, but now we are claiming that this issuer is also an authoritative member of a specific governance framework and a trust registry. That's a lot of terms, but what this really means is if I now go and go back to that verifier, and I would go reload that web page. I would request that verifiable presentation. I am going to select a different credential this time. I want the one that has Jane in it. So here you see my credential with Jane. If I verify it, you can now see that we've added a new verification. And it's actually not a valid credential anymore because the issuer wants to be an authoritative member and wants to say, I am I'm truly allowed to issue that credential. You can see that there is now a trust register membership check added to this verification, which is not true. This issue is not authorized, right? I can change that quite quickly by going here, adding that issuer to this registry going through that presentation again. And now you can see it is valid and the issue, oh wait, I've used the wrong one. I'm like, wait, and this is a specific check. Has Jane, let's verify. Still says it's in palette. Just a demo gods working with me. Validate that I am. Oh wait, I'm issuing it as JP. That is the problem. There we go. Change that back to the one for Jane. And there we go. The trust register membership is now valid. Um, as an issuer, I was JP at Trinsic.id, but my um, for my kind of demo wallet was JP plus demo, so I had to had to add that specific email as a valid issuer. Um, and there you go. Now we've added um, the fact that JP is allowed to send this identity credential. So in case Zach would get that credential from me and show up somewhere, it would be clear that you know it wasn't the U.S. government. Um, that has actually signed that specific identity document. Um, if there are no further questions, I'll give the floor to Zach, I think, to talk a little bit more about the price challenge.
Um, feel free to drop some questions in. All right, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the prize challenge. We can get back to any questions. Um, I mean, we could talk about, we could do, we have like a, a choppy demo to answer Walt's, uh, Otto's question a little bit as well, we could talk about, but um, yeah, actually, Lamari, do you want to say anything first? Do you want me to go, go ahead? Uh, no, you can go ahead and, and detail the price. So we have sponsored prize challenges and Trinsic is one of them. Uh, there's also a main diff prize poll. So I'm going to let Zach detail Trinsic's prize challenge. Yeah. Awesome. So one of the things that we're, we are thinking a lot about at Trinsic right now is how to get valuable data in the form of a verifiable credential, right? So as JP talked about that cold start problem, you know, why would a user want a wallet if there were no credentials in it, especially no credentials that could kind of get them anything interesting or, you know, uh, contain any sort of valuable information. So really what we want to see is somebody like building an integration with a valuable data source um, to basically get, you know, data into a credential into the hands of a user. So there's a few potential examples in the, um, like the dev post sponsor prize listing. So, you know, connecting to a social network API to issue a user credential about, you know, their social following or their verification status on a platform, um, like Spotify wrapped the end of the year is coming up. So rather than posting a screenshot that you're in the top 1% of listeners, um, could you find a way to give people some, you know, verifiable proof that they're a, a big listener of their favorite artist or a big fan in some way? Um, so there's a few other examples there, but the whole idea is that identify a data source that a user could, you know, go out, authenticate into, and then kind of grab some of that, that information, put it into a verifiable credential into a user's wallet. Um, we, as JP demoed, the Trinsic platform should make it really easy to define a credential template, um, you know, to essentially connect to an API, connect to Trinsic, issue that credential. You saw a little bit of like the white label wallet and the verification flow. So you can certainly and hopefully use the Trinsic platform to speed up this process, but we're also not um, opposed or exclusive to you having to use Trinsic. If there's a really interesting or compelling um, demo or data source that uses some of the other technology stacks within the hackathon, um, you're welcome to submit it here because I think you know what's what's more interesting and important to us is kind of like the spirit of the challenge of like building these integrations um, and, and bringing valuable data into the into the verifiable credential and decentralized identity space. Um, so again, there's a few requirements, mainly that you you know record a video demo talking about data sources you've integrated, the credential template you've defined, and then you know bonus points for a compelling use case or story about you know, why it was uh, interesting or compelling. So um, again, we're happy to kind of help brainstorm in Discord, set up, you know, calls or chats with anybody else. Um, yeah, so there's a few questions in the chat here. Uh, we don't necessarily require that you submit your source code. No, the 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 video recording of the demo is is fine. I know we've spoken to a few folks that are working on projects where they wouldn't want to disclose everything that they're, they're doing, but they would be happy to share a demo. And that's totally, totally okay with us. Um, so yeah, I don't know, JP or Lamari, anything you want to add? Yeah, or... just one thing I'll add is that um, the, uh, so all the sponsor prize challenges, they, we, we, we gave them free reign to um, make them open source, cl uh, closed source tooling. It didn't matter for our sponsor prize pools. Great thing about the hackathon is that you can submit to as many categories as you want, as long as it fits the criteria of that particular challenge. Uh, just keep in mind, just be careful that if you are submitting something that you're creating for a sponsored prize pool for the diff main prize pool, the diff main prize pool does have to all be open source. So it, it could disqualify you if it doesn't have everything um, open source in that submission. Uh, so watch out for that. But if you just want to go through all the sponsored prize challenges, you don't have to worry about that. So, great. JP, anything else you want to add before we go? 
Nope, I don't think so. We'll be monitoring the Discord channel, so feel free to drop any questions there. Uh, I'm in there as well, so anything technical, happy to come and help out. Um, the um, I had some resources, but basically dashboard.transit.id, docs.transit.id, um, and docs.transit.id slash examples, which is also linked in the docs. Basically, the examples contain uh, the kind of same um, content that I went through today, so it should be pretty easy to, um, to get started. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for joining and um, good luck hacking. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us today. And I dropped in the chat, the Discord channel specific to Trinsic. And of course they shared their Slack channel as well. So either place is gonna be good to go and ask questions. So yeah, so thank you so much uh, to everyone for joining us today. And uh, we are going to have sessions starting again next week, starting on Tuesday with ontology. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you all there. All right, thanks once again, everyone. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Lamar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye all.